Hi there, you are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. This is Matt Wakeling from Sydney, Australia. Hope you're doing really well and welcome to the show. Today it's episode number 162 with the amazing Thomas Blug from Germany. Incredible guitar player and a, a, a complete design genius. Thomas worked for HK, Hughes and Kettner for many, many years and has recently launched his Blue Guitar range of amps, guitars, um, all sorts of new stuff on the horizon too. So it was really cool to have Thomas on the show. You know, he actually reminds me of someone like Les Paul or Tom Schultz, like a very accomplished musician, a very top level gear designer. So it's pretty cool seeing that in the one musician. It's been a pretty awesome week for the show. Uh, seven days ago, the Philip Sace interview launched. Philip, of course, the Canadian Strat Master. Another Strat guy on today. I can see a theme. And uh, midweek, we launched our iconic album series. That's where I'm joined by my friends, my good friends, Rob Rhodes and Gabor Jessica. And we choose a classic guitar record and talk all about it. Last week, we spoke about Joe Satriani's Surfing with the Alien. Had a great time. There's another album coming out next week. So uh, I encourage you to subscribe to the Guitar Speak podcast for all of our interviews and now our iconic albums series as well. This episode is brought to you by The Pedal Movie, a feature-length film all about effects pedals created by the Music Gear Marketplace Reverb. I am super excited about this film. The Pedal Movie features nearly 100 interviews with people like Steve Vai, Peter Frampton, Jay Mascus, Billy Corgan, and more, including some of our Guitar Speak podcast alumni like Dweezil Zappa, Sarah Lipstate, Johnny Barmer, and Brian Wampler. Reverb's The Pedal Movie is available now on iTunes, Google Play, and Vudu. For more information, visit www.thepedalmovie.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott. Now, Joe is not only a fantastic guitar player, he draws on his years of experience as the ex-head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology and also at the McNally Smith Music College. Here's a few words from Joe about the course. If you're tired of wading through hundreds of random guitar videos and just want to become a better player, Fretboard Biology is your answer. Fretboard Biology is a self-paced, college-level program that will give you the right instruction, in the right amounts, and in the right order. You'll learn the same information I taught to thousands of other guitar players over 30 years of teaching in top music colleges. If you want to make real progress with your guitar playing, then sign up for a free 7-day trial at fretboardbiology.com. Thomas Blug, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. Great to have you. Now, I understand it's Sunday morning, your time in Germany, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. I believe you played a gig last night. Yeah, I actually did. It's uh, been a long time for us guitarists and musicians in general yep. uh, to be able to play. <clears throat> I had one before, like two weeks ago, um, which was um, in Bavaria, which is kind of a county in Germany, um, and they were the first um, area that opened uh, or allowed the, the the concerts in front of real people again after the pandemic, or which is still going on. But the numbers are so low now okay. that we can actually do gigs. Oh, and um, last night was was a gig here in my area like half an hour ago only and uh, it has been postponed like twice already so you know from 2 uh, 20 to end of 220 and then we couldn't do it and then finally it worked out everybody's super happy with i'm i had a great time yeah. i had, you know playing is such a, a good thing for both sides for for me the musician uh, and the audience, you can tell people are really happy. It's like, you know, we have now in in, in German summer. It's it, w- it was really hot, like Sydney almost. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, uh, not not so typical for Germany. I mean, we have we have a nice summer as well, but uh, it, it was it was a pretty hot day. But you know, after the concerts, um, well, the concert outside, standing there. 
having a beer and talking to the people, you know, without masks, killer. Yeah. It's, you know, and, you know, chatting a bit about some of the fans, you know, and uh, seeing them. And they, they, some people traveled hours, mm -hmm. which is so rewarding. You know, yeah. when you hear the stories, oh, oh he took um, some, some guy took a, a hotel room um, like around the corner in a hotel and, and other people <clears throat> too, you know, and they, they, they drove whatever, four hours to see me or us. Yeah, wow. wow. That's fantastic. So good. Yeah. So good. We're starting to see some music here in Australia again as well, which is, which is really exciting. So I'm glad you got back on yeah. stage. Now, is this with your band Rock I think, Action? Uh, yeah, this is uh, the, the band is called Rock Anarchy, and the concept okay. <laughs> of that band band um, is a funny one because um, the singer in the band is also the bass player. We are basically a three piece band, mm -hmm. and that goes back to my teenager days. Um, in in the, ah, well, well, actually, this was maybe late 80s when in Germany we had a, a music uh, style called Neue Deutsche Welle which is a new wave basically but the Germans maybe you remember da 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 yeah da 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 <laughs> and by the way this guy played a 61 a white 61 strat as well um, but anyway so in that time I had I was hired as the lead guitar player for a four-piece band. And the bass player of that band left the band because he got offered a, a very good job at a bank in Frankfurt. And then we had the problem of how do we continue? Do we get another bass player? And I said, you know what? We keep it simple. You, if you play, uh, the singer was also playing guitar. If you play the bass, um, we make more money because we have yeah. only free to share. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he said, oh, that's a clever idea. Okay, then I play the bass and you do all the guitars. <laughs> so we did that for a while. And then in my life, uh, uh, and at that time, we were kind of a, a cover band uh, doing a stuff of this new wave, um, Neue Deutsche Welle, new wave with German lyrics weird stuff you know back in the days this was square <laughs> music but anyway um and then um our we we there was never uh, uh, um we we fall apart because my professional career uh con was taking place on a higher level so i wasn't available anymore so that you know, we're, we're still friends but we lost contact and then like 25 years later I was actually walking here in my hometown and I thought, there's a band playing. I know that voice. And then there was my friend from back in the days still playing the bass and singing. And then we, we, we talked again. And I, I thought, you know, man, it was such a big fun with us uh -huh. when we were teenagers. We should do that again, but we had no drummer. So I said, you know, oh, I, I, I play gigs with anybody. I mean, it's like from Ian Pace to Mel Gaynor of the Simple Minds to all the Germans, even yeah, to yeah. French. And uh, I had so many drummer friends. It's not a problem. I called somebody up for, you know, for the cover shows. Everybody knows the songs. It's it's like standards. Yeah. And what happened is we, we, we played one gig and we had so much fun. I said, okay, let's do it again. And by now it's like, maybe the 10th years already <laughs> and we can't stop it everybody loves it including us and anarchy means we never had any rehearsal we just go on stage and we play what's in our heads and sometimes we even make mistakes on stage but we have such a good laugh about it even the audience love likes it and it's like last night i came up with um you know, it's like, man, that's a hard one. That is. We played that maybe, yeah, and, and it's like, okay, the first round, you know, he was clever and said, okay, I'm not following you. But then he thought, okay, I join in. And it worked. You know, it's all that kind of thing. That's great you know? fun. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's about fun and, yeah, it works. 
That's awesome. Yeah, that's Stevie Wonder if that's a killer. What else is, was on the set list last night? Um, um, I have my own version. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, hey, Joe, in a funky version. Okay. But um, the middle section was spiced up with um, um, Rod Stewart's Passion. You, you, you can, you can, you know, passion. <laughs> and then um, I think there was some uh, Stormbringer by by uh, Deep Purple in there. It's the same tempo. So my concept is always if I have a, a, a tempo and a key, yeah, I'm good to go for something. But sometimes we miss things up, like we, we play Black Knight and uh, we have the shuffle going. Mm-hmm. And in the, in the, in the shuffle, we play something like This Flight Tonight by Nazareth, okay. which is usually on the straight bit, but yeah, yeah. Da, 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 da. it does work. It, it, you, <laughs> we make it fit in a way. That's awesome. And then uh, and I throw in all kind of um, um, film music scores, like melodies from films, like, of course, the Pink Panther and... And I don't know what it is. The dirty, dirty, da 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 I shot Sheriff. You can do anything once the beat is established. That's great. That's great. I've played all of those songs on gigs, but never in the same song. So that's uh that's awesome. Yeah, but that's this is our concept, and if possible, with as many surprises as possible. Also for the musicians. So if I see there is a routine going on, it's like, okay, haha, we are so smart and clever and do it, then it loses the freshness. Okay, and that's that. This is when I I'm kind of. I give you an, another one, you know, <laughs> see how this goes. And <laughs> the challenge is the key for us. I mean, you know, playing smoke on the water is is not a, a very rewarding thing for a musician at a certain level. But playing smoke on the water in a different style or inside another song can be a surprise and that's cool again yeah nice so that's the anarchy <laughs> that's cool i would love to see you guys that sounds awesome that sounds great now mm. what, what came first for you thomas was it playing guitar or designing uh equipment well it when i was a teenager at age 11 it my first hobby was electronics okay and um, i was a uh, more a listener uh, of course, I didn't play. <laughs> and um, my father was at university and he he took me to all these um, students. And uh, in German, we call it Wohngemeinschaften. It's like the students um, gather up in, in a house, like three, five people to share a flat for saving money. And there, there were guys, cool guys that had record collections. And these record collections were... Uh, like older than the music I would usually listen to because they were kind of in between my father's age and my age, you know? So he was teaching them and I was the the, the little guy uh, boy. And uh, so I I got into the Rolling Stones and uh, All But King, you know, at, at a time in in whatever early eighties where, where people were listening to totally different music Mm. And and so so I had the music that I was um, listening was the music from more or less the seventies or late sixties, okay. which is the good guitar music, yeah, yeah, <laughs> mainly, <laughs> yeah. And um, so my first hobby was um, I was building my own stereo for home, okay. like hi-fi equipment, yeah. and speakers. And then the next, like two years later. Um, I I discovered the, the guitar, and uh, 
then um, of course I, I built my my first amp for myself, okay. which was horrible, but <laughs> <laughs> it was fun to do. Yeah. And then finding out the hard way that a guitar amp is not a hi-fi amp. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, how old are you when you're but, building amps? Um, probably. Let me think. 11-ish, 12. Wow. That's so I, st I, I started the guitar with 13. Okay. And, and and the electronic must be like two years ago, kind yeah. of. Okay. Wow. That's really young to be and I learned that stuff. Yeah. But but I, I, I learned the electronics from a technician who was working at the university where my father worked. Okay. And he, um, after school, he took me to a university to do my homework. And then um, I found the university pretty boring because, you know, all those professors talking and being in suits back in the days. Okay. And it's like <laughs> not, nothing exciting to me, but the technician had his own laboratory mm -hmm. and it was a cool guy. And he had something, he took me to, to all, all kind of video equipment, audio equipment, and he showed me how to use a soldering iron and stuff like that. Oh, so this, okay. you know. That, that that was me. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when did um, so when you you're thirteen, you you're playing guitar. You're trying to build some guitar amps. Now, was there a stage yeah. in your guitar playing when you noticed tone? So if you if you grew up trying to play Rolling Stones songs or a Deep Purple song, did you was there a a trigger in your mind where you thought, hang on, that sounds like Richie Blackmore. He's got his own tone versus maybe someone else yeah of course uh, i mean it started right at the beginning you know my, my my first attempt to the guitar was an acoustic guitar and i bought a pickup so i had a nylon string with a pickup into a stereo system and of course this didn't sound anything like the rolling stones yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah. so so that that was clear i need an electric guitar and I started kind of really from scratch. Then I had an electric guitar, and then there, I, I had a magazine, and I bought a, uh, a, and I built myself like a overdrive pedal fast box. It, it, it was a, actually a proper overdrive. But then again, that sounded shit because it was still a hi-fi system. <laughs> then I bought guitar speakers, and then after having guitar speakers, I found out that my transistor hi-fi amp didn't make a good sound. So I bought. I built myself a whatever eight band uh, EQ to to kind of change the frequencies, and that brought me to kind of a level. Then I got my first tube amp, um, which was a like still a hi-fi amp uh, used in a church, like a ten watts. I I, th I, th I think it was an EL eighty four. Um, okay. Uh, Siemens was the brand, yeah. German brand, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> for church um, uh, speakers. And then I noticed, okay, that tube amp with my guitar speaker uh, uh, was getting me somewhere. Okay. And then I, I you know, I'm, so so I step by step I got there. And then I was so fed up that I decided, you know what, all my homemade crap is not getting me where I want it. So I asked somebody, what is the best amp in the world? Okay, still be, me being a teenager, maybe 14 by then. I, I was very, a lot of things happened in that year. I, I was fascinated by the whole thing. So the, the learning curve was kind of steep. Um, and then somebody said, Carlos Santana plays a, a Mesa Boogie. So I had to make tons of money as a teenager to afford a Mesa Boogie because they were kind of the most expensive amps yeah, yeah. back in those days. Mm -hmm. And then I I got myself a job where I installed like radio clocks, alarm clocks in a hotel building, like a, a huge hotel with whatever, 10 floors and 150 rooms. Okay. And me still being a teenager, I made the deal as I had, okay, I can bought, I, I buy that, those and I install those. So I, I had like a special saw and a vacuum cleaner okay. and, you know, and, and did the whole job in my, 
um, in the in the summer break, and uh, that the, the whole six weeks working and having the deal made the money to pay a used Mesa boogie. Nice. And yeah, so then I got a Mesa boogie, but it was a Mesa boogie MK two B. Okay. But I mean, it's a it's a it's a proper amp. It's like a twelve L EV speaker. Yeah, big and, heavy uh, one. Oh yeah, I, I tell you, this thing was so heavy. <laughs> and then having that that amp, I I was an, on another level. Mm. And I used that in my band. And then I found out in the band for for some of the music we we played, the amp was not thick enough. And then I found out about you know Jimi Hendrix. He's got that um, smoky. Uh, big rumbly, you know, tone, and it was a Marshall, yeah, you know. Yeah. So then I bought a Marshall, and then yeah, I went from there, and and then um, I bought a what was it, my Fender Princeton as as a clean amp. The Mesa Boogie was pretty good for for, for I had high gain, which was good. Because I learned how to play fast, um, but on the Marshall I learned how to play accurate. Because coming from the Mesa, with that technique, the Marshall doesn't sound right. Right. Okay. You know. Do you mean like so clean, cleaning up your technique? Is that what you mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It, it, and that that was a, a major, big, big, big influence on my style. Yeah. How to how to put the energy behind the notes so that the amp, that the, that the Marshall or the amp, but yeah. in, in that case, the Marshall produced a rich tone like the Mesa. On the Mesa, you can play tapping <clears throat> and uh, it's rich and mm -hmm. you know has tons of gain and stuff like yeah. that. But on the Marshall, I had to fight for it. So at a very young age, I learned both things to play uh, to play light and to play heavy. Okay, okay. And that's, and I think that's that's one of my uh, ingredients of my style. Yeah, S still yeah, to sure. do, to this day. Well, so yeah, I mean, what I love about when I hear you play is that yeah, you're very very dynamic. So um, yeah, yeah, backing off on the volume, cranking it, you know, and all all points in between. I, I love that. So. When I, that's that's pretty yeah. self-aware though for you to be working that out at the age of fourteen. That's amazing. And what you've been playing a couple of years by then. Yeah, I mean, it uh, it, it is. But what's even more scary, I have when I was seventeen, which means I have had played four years the guitar. I was already booked as a session player. Can you imagine that? Uh -huh. I mean. Looking back wow. now, it's like unbelievable. But I have all audio cassettes, and I I I still had uh, recordings of myself in like my first year. And you can tell, okay, I'm pentatonic box one. I had some groove already going. That that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> to 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 listen back to your very first steps into the thing. And you can tell I was after the solo guitar from right from the beginning you know there's there's like this there's this dedicated rhythm guys you know that today would play metal yeah, yeah. Uh, and and there's the, the the solo guys which is more my territory of course i play man, many uh rhythm guitars in my life and i still do but it's like I'm waiting for my solo. <laughs> and and I was the same when I was a teenager when I yeah. started. But <laughs> but the, the thing is um having the experience of um recording in a studio, getting paid at that young age and listening to what you've delivered mm -hmm. was another thing because you know when you are recorded in a proper studio and the engineer plays back what you just did, you focus on the tone much more than a regular player at that age. It's like, yeah, yeah. ah, okay. And, and, and so the tweaking and the awareness for tone was always there, but 
you know, it came at such an early stage that helped me really to get where I am now um, okay. and and find all these different tones and nuances. And, you know, by the end of my teenage, I had al already a, a Vox AC30, a Fender, a Marshall, a Mesa Boogie. Um, you, know, you know, I mean, this is... And, and for good reason, because I used it, mm. you know, uh, and and I knew why I use it. It's not I bought it because whatever uh, the Beatles had a Vox AC30. Yeah, no, yeah. I used it because I I knew this is the amp that makes that kind of noise on a record. And um, wow, I mean, again, that amp awareness that's that's impressive at a young age. Um, we must be about we must be close in age. I'm I've just turned fifty. Um, in the late yeah. '80s, I just thought if you had every single pedal, you could get every single sound. Mm -hmm. But until I did some recording, that that was my big eye opener for different amps, really being mm -hmm. the tone, which is what you're saying exactly at that young age already, which is really cool. Yeah. So so somehow when I'm look, looking back on on what happened in my life, it's it's a lot of kind of lucky coincidences that that were leading somewhere. Um, and and then you know, um, I had a conflict. Like my father, they, they wanted to to have me going to the university, and I I thought you know, I've been there. I've been bored when I was a young kid. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> doing my homework as you know, I'm not going there. Why? You know, what, what what shall I study? And back in those days, there were no interesting courses for music you there was classical music here in our town or or maybe jazz and i i, I had a, a bad jazz experience um which funny just yes last night before the gig i was shopping and i met the guy this this was a, a, a great story yesterday before um I, I was shopping and i saw the guy that i was attempting to take lessons for jazz when I was a teenager, you know, because okay. I was, I wanted to know. And this, this guy, I had three lessons and he taught, he taught me the modes. He taught me um, some chord things and the tritonal substitution thing in, in, in three lessons. And he, he said, Oh, you're very talented. And then at the third lesson, I asked him about Pat Metheny Mm -hmm. And uh, if he could show me something of Pat Metheny, and and this guy was like, Pat Metheny, he is the worst jazz musician ever, <laughs> and it, I, it hurt me, you know, it hurt me, and and this this guy is like a a hardcore jazz nerd, and 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 he was so narrow minded, and I could feel that as a teenager, so I I I went upset that Heiner was his name, Heiner. Keep your money. Jazz sucks. I'm out. So, <laughs> and that that killed my jazz input for the next twenty years. Okay. You know this 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 moment. And the funny thing is, yesterday when I was shopping in in the supermarket, I saw Heiner again after forty years or whatever. Wow. wow. Uh, and I said, "What is the jazz doing?" And he and he said, "I quit." I said, "What's wrong?" You know, oh, there's too many. <laughs> and I thought, you know, coming from his mouth, wow. it's like, okay, this is kind of interesting. It's like, um, and it's, I thought, okay, let's go on in this conversation, find out. And and we had actually a really good conversation. Okay. So I took his phone number, and if I have a little bit more time, we have, we we were so deep in the conversation, and and he asked, uh, maybe we should have a coffee and you know talk more. Because this is getting interesting here, and he said about his life where well, he was a um, Protestant um, pastor, pastor, okay, the preacher. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, to get out of that, he was a jazz player, and then uh, whatever his life was kind of zigzag. Wow. And um, anyway, we had a good conversation yesterday. A, a special guy, and this will be continued. So I got his phone number and. You know, maybe next week or so we have a coffee and and see what what's up with jazz and why. <laughs> see if you can work and, it out. <laughs> yeah. See what he thinks but, about Pat Metheny now. He might have changed his mind. 
this is I'm, what I'm curious about <laughs> to find out, yeah. you know, because now when he is in a different state in his life, yeah. maybe he sees things differently. And I want to find out that this is exactly what I'm curious about. Yeah. Wow. And, um, yeah so that, I, I couldn't do this like on on like in the three minute conversation because i had to go to the gig you know yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like yeah I, I was a bit late already and <laughs> um uh, but this this is what i'm curious about I, i'll find out about Petrusini and heiner <laughs> <laughs> thomas you ended up still designing gear and you worked with Hughes and Kettner for many years before striking out on your, on your own. What kind of stuff yeah. were you designing with Hughes and Kettner? Um, well, I, 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 you know, when being, what, what was my age, maybe 20 by then, um, um, you know, I had this, this recognition here in the area and Hughes and Kettner is from the same area. Um, to be a you know a good guitar player that has experience in studio um i spent 27 years with Houston Kettner wow. and i was involved in basically everything except for the AS64 which was their first product okay and that that was a programmable amp a, a, a brilliant technology product and my first job was to promote or to demonstrate that amp okay and yep. um so i liked the you know back in the days this was whatever 86 or whatever no no it was later wait a minute it must be oh i i forgot we have to look it up um <laughs> but anyway this amp had um built in effects like uh, a reverb, like uh, a delay programmable, and like a chorus, and it was fully programmable. Mm -hmm. And this was, I think this was the first fully programmable amp. Yeah, I, I haven't, I don't think there was another company being that advanced at that time. And, but there, there were a, a few things that were very weird. Like they had two 12 inch speakers that were not in line, so they had a wider spread. So one was angled to the left side, oh, okay. uh, and the guitar player standing in the middle was like me, was being in the dead zone. There was no, okay. not a good sound. And the guy, the bass player, got got all the, the noise from, from, <laughs> from the one speaker, you know, complaining about it. Need to so, turn down. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So um, after me demonstrating that amp, my first, when I came back to the to the guys, I said, you know, we have to change the product. This is this is this is not working. And also, I learned a lot of things which are very important for anything I've I've done later. Like I've been on stage with that amp. And the voltage dropped because outside, you know, sometimes there's a uh, not stable voltage because of some, you know, festival and the lights go on and then, and then the voltage drops. And then this amp switched off and it rebooted on the clean channel preset one, which is clean and chorus okay. in the middle of your solo. Uh, that's you know, so fun. I've been there too. <laughs> and then this is like, hey guys, you know, for instance, like, what I'm doing now with my blue guitar stuff is if it, if it shut off in a way, it will definitely come back exactly where it was ah, as okay. fast as possible. Yeah. That's me because I learned it. You know, I'm, I would never want to be stupid on stage. Like, you know, my amps have to be stage proven. Mm. It's like somebody unplugs anything, you plug it back in, it still works and it's back where, where it's been. That's rule number one and no compromise because I learned the hard way, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, that, that's the great thing about being a, a working musician. You, you know exactly what you'd expect when you're on the stage as well as in the designing yeah. stage. 
I hope you are enjoying today's interview. Now, this podcast is brought to you by The Pedal Movie, a feature-length film all about effects pedals created by the music gear Mark Place Reverb. Now, you know we love guitar pedals here on the Guitar Speak podcast, and we're super excited on the release of this film. The Pedal Movie explores how effects pedals and their builders have shaped modern music and guitar playing over time, from the fuzz pedal experiments of the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix, through the shoegaze and indie rock of the 90s, and up to the modern day use of effects. Reverb also speaks with builders and leaders from more than 50 pedal brands to answer the big question, how did guitar pedals get so big? Reverb's The Pedal Movie is available now on iTunes, Google Play and Vudu. For more info, check out thepedalmovie.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by master guitar teacher Joe Elliott. Now, I was a beta tester for the course, and as a music educator myself, I was very impressed by the logical layout and format of the course. Heavyweight guitarists such as Brett Garsett and Greg Koch have also endorsed the program, so check it out at www.fretboardbiology.com. Okay, back to our interview. Well, let's, let's talk about the blue guitar stuff because your amp one um, has yeah. been such a success around the world. It's um, been lauded by so many great players. Um, players I've had on this podcast like Jennifer Batten, absolutely loves yeah. her her amp and uh, yeah, the blue one. one and Jude Gold as well. Um, yep, had great things. And that's just a couple of people I've spoken to. Um, what was the inspiration to leave H and K? And and produce your own range of amps and and what was the story behind the well, amp it, one? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, if you work in a company for twenty seven years, you know the company inside out. Mm -hmm. And I spent fifteen years there. Well, I had the best time of my life because they let me do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's good for Thomas, it it it's okay. You know, after. After my bad experience with their first M, they um, and and the changes and then the products that were created out of that, and then also my sound design with uh, with in co collaboration with Bernd Schneider is the technician there, um, were getting Hughes and Kettner to a level where you know international players connected to that brand <clears throat> and. When the company grow bigger, I felt a bit more disconnected, you know, because it's like uh, in the in the beginning it was like a small company where decisions were made at a coffee machine. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like you know, um, there was the guy from production, there was the technician, there was myself, and maybe even the marketing guy, and we all, you know, had a coffee and we take we we had super fast decisions and we were in soup okay as the company grew bigger there were different departments and you had meetings at the beginning it was still okay but then the the spreadsheet uh guys took over okay and i was actually offered to be the products um no what, what is the english word product manager for using Ketner. Okay. And I said, hey, guys, I do whatever and I work more than any of the full-time employees, but I need to be freelance because I'm still a musician and um, I need that flexibility. And I totally understand if you want somebody that is doing that job, but that's not me, mm -hmm. you know? So they, they didn't offer me that flexibility. And... Um, of course, you know, my passion was always there with with anything I do, I do with passion because that's what's driving me. You know, money, money is just there to, to make things happen in a way, but it's, I'm, I'm not a money driven person. I'm passion. Passion is, is the thing. I do stuff for free just because I want to do it. Okay. And um, so what happened is, um, I could see that the the, the company using Kettner uh, evolved in a different direction, which is fair enough. Um, but on the other hand, I had still 
my dreams. And in the early days, I could realize my dreams with them. And then I could feel, no, it's, it, it's not getting my dreams anymore. It's, it, I had to compromise in a way. And um, I, I, I took that for a few years, like, okay, maybe I'm doing more music and be happy in that state. But I found out I want to do my stuff non-compromise. Okay. And then yeah, sure. one day I simply split and I had uh, no bad feelings. It's like, hey, guys, I know what's going on and you want that, but I want something different. And then I said, you know, guys, I, I do my, my own company because something like the M1 um, could not be done with with such a company with compromises because if you open up a new technology that is um, just imagine I, I play the best tube amps with all my collection you can see here just just here okay oh awesome yeah um, we've got a pile and, of marshals and, on the floor for the listening uh yeah, Marshalls, Marshall uh, Blackface Fenders, yeah, you, you name it. You know, it's 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 all here. And I have another floor with more. It's it's like I'm, uh, I have tons of stuff. Um, and and this is my level. You know, I'm not about compromise. This is like, I have a, a real sixty one Strat that I bought when I was seventeen, and that's that's um, yeah, that's that's the level. It's like. I, I'm not about compromise, I, not on the sound, you know? So, and when you start your own vision of a new technology, you have, you have to have a, a situation where you have nobody stopping you. And if I would have done this with any company, nobody knows how long R&D takes to do something right. I mean, it's easy to have a, a theory in your head and, and, and make whatever a class D amplifier and you have a little overdrive box and you combine the two things. But this would make me feel like back in the teenage days. It's like, you know, when I had my hi-fi amp and an EQ mm. and, a, and, a, and an overdrive pedal. I mean, sorry, I've been there at age, whatever, 13, 14. And it's, it's like, no, this is not the way it's right. This is not the way that makes me happy. And, you know, the older you get, the more you know what you want. And, and I was, I was aware that developing something like an M1 with my, um, what, for, what was the word for uh, expectations, like no compromise level, you cannot put any numbers on that. You know, this might cost you a hundred thousand or whatever, mm -hmm. five hundred thousand. And if it's not, it is nothing for a guy with a spreadsheet. It's it's something I had to do on my own risk. And this is what I've done. And therefore, this was a, a totally logical progression. Um, it was a big step too. And I was thinking, man, should I found my own company? I'm not a I'm not a business guy. Uh, I learned something as a producer, which I always worked. Uh, nobody knows that, but I, <laughs> I had a few records from other people that I produced, oh, okay. um, which was uh, a an experience. But again, this wasn't something I've done, and I decided not to do anymore. But it's you know, it's that the dream. You 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 write that hit record, and then you have a million, and you can do whatever you mm -hmm. want. Okay, I've, I've been there too. I had a hit, but I had no million. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I've seen that side of the business too. And I know how, how you have to, to work to, to get to the, the level where you probably make a million, only probably make that million. And I, being there, um, seeing how that business works, I, I decided, no, I'm not becoming that kind of producer. That's not my life. Um, but back to the to the blue guitar story, um, and the, the decision at that age, I thought I've seen enough 
um, with other companies uh, because I've been in the music industry for so many years and I'm, I work for Steinberg um, because at, at all these years I've been freelance. So I worked for Jusen Kettner, I worked also for some other companies and I could see other operations Very interesting um, to see that small business, you know, the freaky guitar builder that has only one employee or is, self, is one guy and, and that is able to make one brilliant guitar in a year and then to a mass-produced um, company that, that makes a, a totally different um, amount of products and totally different... It, it, it needs to have different ways to deal with it business wise anyway and and then i thought you know what fuck it that's the last lesson i have to learn in my life as well you know so how to survive as a business um to be able to do the non-compromised products that i want right, right so and then and then there was the decision i i went to my tax account and said you know what i do a company it's called blue guitar And here we go. And then I had another thing about Blue Guitar. Uh, somebody is calling. Wait a minute. Are you back? Yep, yep, gotcha. Okay. Uh, why is this? Okay, anyway. Um, I, I had this thing with my name, Blue Guitar, I had that, I mean, it makes a lot of sense to, to call it Blue Guitar because this was the decision, what I wanted to do the rest of my life, you know, be myself and have something to do with guitar and making products with that. And <clears throat> then the, the lawyer said, <clears throat> it, it is a Blue Guitar is a descriptive name. It's like a, a red guitar, a green guitar and a blue guitar. Okay. And you cannot... We like cannot color. protect it. Right. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, this is my last name. Yeah. And it's without the E, you know, it's like my last name and then com combined. And then I found somebody that actually um, got this uh, protected at the um, patent, um, patent uh, whatever, authority. Yeah, this is. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about, about about my blue guitar logo and about my name. That's that's all good, and it makes me um, teach you how to spell my last name yeah, too, because right. it's not <laughs> black guitar. Or you know, usually when I was touring as a musician, I Mr. Black, and I says, okay, I, I have no problems with that. You can call me what you want, but yeah. now it's blue guitar, and it's like Thomas Blue, so. There we go. Very cool. Now, the Amp One, of course, was a huge hit, and you're still producing it. And there's a there's a couple of yes. models now, which is which is brilliant. You've also expanded uh -huh. the blue guitar range into your guitar, your '61 style custom shop. And I'd love to talk about the Amp X as well. Let's talk about the guitar first, though. Oh man, there yeah. it is. Here's here's one, and this one has still the forbidden headstock. You oh know? yeah, yeah. And well, I ended up um, with a big, I wouldn't so, say lawsuit, but Fender, as they should, yeah. protects their <clears throat> their headstock and sure. their copyrights. So one day I got a big letter from lawyers from Munich in uh -huh. Germany with about 30 names on it, and it was 50 pages. It's like you have to pay 500,000 euros or something okay. <laughs> for viol violence in copyright protection. The good thing is I know a lawyer who's, who already had that experience. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he was fighting that. And so I changed the headstock to my shape, which is um, very similar but might even look better. And here's my gig bag from last night. Okay. So that's my headstock. Oh, there you go. Yep, <laughs> yep. And that's that's the same headstock like Trevor Wilkinson, the hardware um, 
and and guy behind some UK brands, vintage for example. Yeah. Um, Fred King. And Trev is a good friend of mine, and he has that head stock shape signed off by Leo Fender himself. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. So I'm totally safe. <laughs> and, and so Fender stopped. Uh, stopped attacking me or whatever so i can do that shape yeah, all good sure, sure and um basically what it is this guitar is the copy of of, of the guitar that i played all my life which is here still in the gig bag from last night can you see oh yeah so this that's cool. and then I, I i can put them side by side and you can see how dirty my guitars are can you see yeah 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 amazing amazing yeah and this one is brand new this is this guitar is played three gigs but it looks like yeah pretty similar to the other one yeah cool and how does it stack up like you've played the fender all your life you've been playing these for a few years now what's the what's the uh yeah i mean result to, to be honest i mean my fender is still a touch better but that's mainly because the guitar has been played so much yeah sure. um and and the more you play the instrument the better they get but the sonic qualities of of my master built guitars is it's stunning i mean it's like um you know all the twang that i want the warmth that i want the the, the fast attack the, the parameters i'm after mm -hmm. they are there nice it's just like the sauce that takes a little time to blend you know the different ingredients uh -huh. and um th th yeah the more you play the guitar the older that new guitar gets the closer it gets to the other one yeah awesome awesome with yeah. your with and your original 61 so you said you got that when you were yeah. 17 that's amazing. I, is it still stock or have you modeled it in any way? Well, I modeled the guitar in, um, that's, you know, I'm, I was always experimenting with that guitar. So um, I still have the original pickups in bridge and neck position. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, being a gigging musician, I found out that the Reverse wound, reverse polarity middle pickup gives me two quiet positions, like for two and four. Yeah, sure. And that, and therefore I, I had uh, changed, swapped the middle position for a reverse wound pickup. Okay. Um, and then I came up with my, what what I call bucker switch, which is this one here. Okay. Yep. So it's um, on. Which is it's on the final tone. Dummy control. coil. Yeah. Okay, so, so, for, so that's a dummy. Yeah, sorry, I'm just huh? jumping in. For people listening, because we're just audio only, so you've got a like a push pull on your on the last tone control. Is that right? Right, it's a it's a push push because on oh, a strat, okay. if you want to pull, the knobs are not super. Yeah, true. Not, 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 true. not super for for pulling, nice. but for push, it's a push push. Yeah. So you um um and when it's like in a normal position in. Yep. It it's stock. Um, it's bypassed. It has okay. no effect. Yeah. But when I push it, uh, it engages uh, a dummy coil. Oh, okay. And that awesome. is only used on the outer position. So yeah, when okay. this is engaged, um, the bridge and neck have yeah. that extra coil to reduce the hum. Oh, very and, cool. And uh, it's automatically bypassed for the middle position. Yeah. Yeah. So. Four out of five positions are kind of quieter. Oh, the middle so position clever. is still, you know, it's still uh, standard. Sure, sure. Oh, that's so clever. That's great. And does it change the oh, tone much when you're uh, when you've got it in the extra coil? Yes. Yeah. Actually, it does change the tone, and I actually like it because it takes away some of the glassiness. Okay. And that's and that's the uh, that's helping um, the guitar when I play higher gain levels. Yeah, okay. So for me, um, I I sometimes switch it off, 
but mostly have it in because my personal style is using the volume control. Yeah. And here's the next ingredient. I have a, a treble bleed on the volume control. So when okay. I back up the volume like to five or seven, I have the extra amount of treble coming from that treble bleed capacitor. Okay. Yeah. And the dummy coil cuts the maybe the stuff that is too much. So of course me I mixed it out for my personal taste. So it's yeah, it, yeah. it's got it's got all the clarity and all the warmth and I balanced out the position and um yeah, I have a guitar where I can actually switch off the treble bleed as well uh, with a push-push and where I can um, engage a master tone. So wait a minute, I just open this this place here. And this, this is this guitar. Wait a minute. <laughs> Thomas has just opened a cupboard that's just full of guitars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which is... And this is a 64 mint condition, another oh, one here, but man. I'm going I'm going for another white one yeah, yeah. to show you this one with a, this like C2 push push. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's 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 the same like on all my other guitars. And this one can switch from standard tone controls to a master tone control. So I have a tone oh, control okay. for the bridge position as well. Nice. And so I know how all these things affect the tone and you can decide if you like it or not. But I, you know, I, of course I have my own taste. I don't like the master tone. It gives you something, but you lose something. So I have okay. to be able to switch it off. Right. right. Nice yeah. one. So anyway, there you go. Taste. very cool, man. Those guitars look awesome. Now, last year during, NAM, which was of course digital and online, um, you mm. did announce the Amp X. Can you tell us yeah. what that's about? That looks amazing. That looks incredible. Yeah, I mean, basically, it sums up my dream of a, a guitar system in a pedal and being not digital. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, you know, there's many great pedals out there and digital pedals are just in yeah, so just see here's another box with the head rush and upstairs i have others you know other toys okay but um i'm i'm not compromising on tone and feel so um i'm good friends with uh, christoph kemper and I, I, I designed also plugins uh, on the Cubase, um, oh, Steinberg okay. Cubase. Yep. So that, that's, that stuff is also in there. So, and I designed an all digital amp um, back in the days with Houston Kettner. So I'm aware of digital sure. um, technology and it's evolving and it's getting better every day. But the last bits they're not getting and i know this and um there's there's always that kind of trade-off for convenience versus tone in a way mm -hmm. and um i'm not about compromise so you know my my basic concept is i'm not doing a digital overdrive i'm not doing a digital sound processing only for effects and and all the, the critical stuff I still do analog. Like okay. if I do my tape delays in my amp X, yeah. the the critical part will not be digital. Also from the tape saturation, it will still be analog. Like the stuff that I've done with the uh, using Getna Replex, which is an Echoplex uh, uh, kind of copy with different technology, which is using a tube and um, a digital chip for the delay line. Okay. So I'm open to use any kind of technology, but I'm, I'm about to make no compromise. So, um, and MPX is basically how you call it. It's everything in one box, fully programmable, but no compromise. And, and so what it is, 
it is um, now it's a 200 watts or whatever you call it. This this thing has headroom like forever. Yeah, yeah. It, power is not an issue anymore. I mean, even with the M1 that is rated at 100 watts, it's not an issue. Um, I had one complaint from Uli John Roth, who used to be in the Scorpions, the yeah. guitar player. And the, he plays the M1, but he wanted one that is, you know, his Black Star amp was still a bit superior in certain situations for him. And then I got his amp and I measured it. And this amp puts out 230 watts at oh. certain nodes. Oh, my goodness. You know, <laughs> Yeah, and this is what he likes. I mean, he wants to feel it. He wants the trousers move. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I modded an M1 to be 230 watts. It's possible. It's not. It's not a. It's not a big problem. Okay. And anyway, this this, this MX has all that. But what's even more important, it has. Um, the concept is, I have uh, created an amp that is uh, so flexible to be able to clone any amp that I've seen so far and that can also be tweaked to anything that I want in the future. It's like a, it's a platform, an all analog platform, digitally controlled, yes. that can do anything on the amp side. And then it's it's combined or paired with a 16-core processor that gives me tons of power for you know all that kind of speaker modulation, uh, speaker simulation, modulation effects, uh, all the stuff that you can get from the digital world. But it is combined. That again is combined with an analog set section for boost, drive, stages, pedals. Um, that is totally analog again. And um, yeah, that's that's my vision of um, a flexible um, device that fits still fits in your gig bag and that has everything on board that can be expanded for whatever needs you have. Um, to any kind of system like stereo, like wet, dry, wet, like uh, all the the outputs are there, all the options are there, but the player decides if he wants to keep it simple and there's like a flap on it. If you close the flap, it looks like a classic amplifier. It's like mm -hmm. a big toggle on switch with a pilot lamp like on a fender and a few knobs that you are all familiar with. But if you open the flap, you enter a new level for effect dialing in with what I call the X controls. It's like four knobs. And what has changed from the first thing that I showed is I have like four little screens, like displays over the knobs. They change with the function. So these oh, okay. are direct access knobs for, the, for instance, the pedals, like if you have a flanger or a delay or... Uh, they changed the, what what the parameters are doing, so I Very have cool. the, the best of the analog world put into a modern um, concept with with just as many knobs as the guitar player knows and some functions. It is basically everything is possible, but it's uh, or a lot is possible. I, I wouldn't say everything, but um, a lot is possible, which is uh, um, which came across in my life, talking to other people, what all, all, all the stuff they want and what I want for myself, um, in a way that is easy, accessible, accessible on stage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with my and X. If somebody yells at you, it's too bright, bomb, there is a treble control for you. Yeah, and it's right. not like you have to go to a menu, it's like amp tone, and then it's treble, and then you dial it in. Um, yeah, I'm still the gigging guy that, that has to react immediately. Yeah. So that's that's the concept of the MX. Yeah, very cool. Is there a release date planned yet? I want to make the big 
boom, bam for NAM next year. I decided okay. with all the COVID things, yeah. and of course, yeah. things take way longer than expected in development. Um, let's use the time and do it properly and um, do the big lounge at NEM in January. Oh, that sounds great. That's, yeah, may, maybe I, I have a little upfront information by the very end of the year. But um, this, you know, it's all about the NEM. Yep, awesome. That's a great plan. Yeah, well, I will keep looking out for it because it looks incredible. It looks really cool. Tom, it's been so fun talking. Before we go, can you tell us a little bit about Academy of Tone, which is your YouTube channel? Ah, I love that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I, you know, when when the COVID thing started last year, um, there were no trade shows anymore. There were no clinics. There were no gigs. And I decided that I wanted to do something on YouTube anyhow, even before I started the Academy of Tone series mm -hmm. um, or channel. Um, and But I didn't have the time. And then there were no excuses anymore. It's like, okay, um, let's do it. So um, that's the good thing about the COVID. It gave me the time to do something like that channel. And um, now we are episode 60, 61, um, which means every week, Wednesday, um, 8 p.m., the German Central European time, whatever time that is for you. But, I mean, the good thing about YouTube videos is you can watch it anytime. So yes. once they are released, it's it's there. But um, most of the stuff I'm doing is actually live, which which is great because then while doing the show, I can get questions and I can immediately react. And, yeah, awesome. and I'm doing a lot of A-B comparisons things. And then if somebody says, yeah, but I want to hear that. And then like, okay, let's check out the whatever blue channel on the Bogner ecstasy uh -huh. versus uh, that M or my Mercury uh, channel, blah, blah, blah. You know, so stuff that I haven't thought of. And that's, that's the, the YouTube is actually a really great format, uh, um, and and it all it connects us all in a very nice way because you know I mean you can watch it and in the old days I just was doing clinics which I'm still looking forward to do again mm -hmm. but it's it's like you know I'm home I got all the gear with me and some sometimes I I, I jump to the next room while doing the show and say ah oh, wait a minute here's this whatever pedal. Mm -hmm. um, Let's try that out. Very cool. That's great. It's, it's all at hand and it's, yeah. And I was thinking about the format, you know, my, usually an episode goes into like two hours long. It's, it, it is way beyond regular time span of people, but it's like, you know, again, I'm not about compromise. It's about let's, let's talk about that subject. And sometimes I even make more episodes about one subject, you know, and, and, and it's still not enough. I mean, I could do like 10 episodes about the guitar players in Ozzy Osbourne or yeah. in Whitesnake or in the Rolling Stones or, you know, but hey, there's more episodes to come. And what's also great is inviting guests um, and uh, national international, local, anything. And it's, um, I'm learning too, you know, it's, it, it's, it's great to have those with me. I, I scheduled something with a German pedal maker, which would be killer. I'm sure, uh, Bernd Meiser, um, BSM pedals. He, he also wrote for a German, uh, guitar magazine or writes guitar and bass killer killer guy, very knowledgeable technician. And and, and and so I'm looking forward to, you know, that that on that new platform, killer. I yeah. love it. Excellent, excellent. Wow. Well, Thomas, you've got so much going on and you've done so much cool stuff. I'm super glad that you could come on the show to, to tell us about this stuff. Um, I'll include all the links to the Academy of Tone and 
the Blue Guitar site for people listening who want to check out your stuff a bit more. I'm sure most of my listeners, if not all, already know uh, plenty about the Blue Guitar stuff anyway, but uh, those links will be there. But, yeah, Thomas, thanks so much for joining me, especially the morning after a gig. Really appreciate that as well. <laughs> no worries. I have a big, big pleasure for yeah for having me. And actually, I'm lo- really looking forward also to, to come to Sydney again. Um, maybe next year when the MPX is out. I have a reason for traveling. Yes. And, yeah, uh, um, yeah so I'm, I'm uh, I love Sydney. I, I like that town. Uh, I, I don't know how it is for you living there, but for me, it can be very nice there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love being a Sydney sider too. Yeah, before we started recording the interview, you were you're were saying you know you've got friends around Newtown and uh, Glebe, yeah. Maroubra near the beaches. So yeah, they're Maru- they're really yeah. cool spots. And all of those places. I spent hours at, at this rock pool at Maroubra, and there was a nice place with some shade for the summer. Uh, you know, when when it was really hot, and I actually was writing for a German magazine like my column there uh-huh. and uh, so so i spent uh, hours days there writing stuff which was cool because you know you have you can watch the sea you have you can have a, a little swim once in a while and the rest <laughs> is being creative very creative town nice <laughs> nice well yeah come back for sure i'd, I'd love to love to catch yeah. up and, and see the ampex in action and uh and all that stuff yeah I got a reason to come. See you maybe next year. Yeah, awesome. (laughs) In person. (laughs) All right. Thanks again, Thomas. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thanks. All right, there you go. Hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Now, this podcast was brought to you by The Pedal Movie, the feature-length film all about effects pedals created by Reverb. Reverb's The Pedal Movie is available now on iTunes, Google Play, and Vudu. For more information, visit thepedalmovie.com. The show was also brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the comprehensive online guitar course put together by ex-head of guitar at GIT, Joe Elliott. Check out fretboardbiology.com for more information. Alrighty then, you have been listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling, and as the legendary German rocker Michael Schenker once told me, Keep rocking, keep on rocking. Keep on rocking indeed. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time. Bye now.